In this Climate Gen episode, Dr. Sean Fitzgerald, OBE, Director of the Centre for Climate Repair in Cambridge, discusses new research to build resilient and scalable kelp growing platforms, asking the key question of whether kelp forests can capture and store a billion tonnes of carbon. As the Centre for Climate Repair forges ahead with its 3 R strategy of reducing emissions, removing carbon from the atmosphere and repairing essential climate systems such as the Arctic, Sean has high hopes for large-scale ocean sequestration, but does not stop short of stating the need for urgent research into engineering methods for reflecting sunlight away from the Earth. These are controversial proposals for many people and yet the climate problem keeps getting worse, with many governments only making tiny, incremental commitments that maintain the status quo of a fossil fuel driven economy and society. The truth is, as Professor Kevin Anderson has stated, that if we rely on the current ambition of our political leaders, we really are going to hell in a handcart. I am interested to hear feedback from listeners and gauge your thoughts on these kinds of proposals. And you can support this work via Patreon, but you can also subscribe for free on all podcast channels and on YouTube. Thank you. Sean, I just want to start by asking if you can give us a definition and an overview of what an offshore kelp platform is and why you're researching this area at all. Offshore kelp is really what I mean by the growing of kelp in the surface waters of the deeper ocean, and specifically with the target that some of that kelp, when at the end of its sort of useful productive time as part of a plant, it sloughs off and takes carbon, therefore, in macroalgae form down to the deeper ocean. So once it's below the surface waters of the deep ocean, once it gets into that deep layer, the idea is that that then hangs around for very long time, hundreds, perhaps thousands of years, certainly hundreds of years. So the area that we're looking at is how can we get more kelp to grow and get it into the deep water? That's what we mean. Okay, so this is particularly focused on carbon sequestration, sort of blue carbon. That's the objective here. It is the objective for the Centre for Climate Repair. But as always, we're looking at how we might develop uh, schemes which have got co-benefits. So The idea of a platform is that not all of the kelp necessarily needs to be just for carbon sequestration. Some of it could be used for supporting local economies. So supporting, for example, food being exported to other countries uh, for cattle feed and things like this, or being used for other products or actually for our own food. So that can help effectively pay for the platform. And therefore, as a co-benefit, it's the carbon sequestration. So depending on which lens you're looking at this from, uh, it could be that the co-benefit is carbon sequestration or the co-benefit is actually supporting local economies. Where is the platform located or to be located? And why have you chosen a specific place? Well, the first project that we are involved with from a research point of view is off the coast of Namibia. Now, the reason that we're starting there is that it is an upwelling zone. And therefore, there is already a bountiful supply of nutrients because when kelp grows and is either harvested or uh, sloughs off and goes into the deep ocean, it doesn't just take down carbon, it takes down nutrients as well. So we've got to think very carefully about the nutrient balance. And we're starting off in areas that are, um, are upwelling. And we wanted to make sure that as a result of growing kelp, that it is additive in terms of the carbon sequestration, because if you've got nutrients available in the right balance, phytoplankton, for example, can grow. And then depending on what happens to that phytoplankton, if that gets into the deep ocean, then growing kelp in its place isn't additive. But if that phytoplankton is eaten by other creatures and then is released back into the environment through the activities of organisms, and it doesn't make it to the deep ocean, whereas the kelp does, then it truly is additive. So the first area we're looking at are these areas of natural upwelling, but that is not the end game. The end game is to look at places where we can actually use the platforms in areas that aren't necessarily upwelling zones, and then to think really carefully about how we ensure that they've got appropriate nutrient provision. From everything you've just said, what are the risks that something could go wrong is it just are they quite benign risks overall or is there something that could upset an ecosystem 
Well, that's a very important question, Nick. And anything that you do in the natural world, I think it would be wrong to say oh, they're benign. No, we are very concerned uh, to learn as much as we can and to go at an appropriate pace where we learn by increment, not by revolution. And one of the big challenges that we've got is uh, growing something that would in an environment that wouldn't grow there naturally. So that's what these platforms do. They allow the kelp to, to grab onto something and then for to grow in the surface waters of the deep ocean anew. Those platforms are providing this structure. But we are concerned about the rate at which you grow kelp. So if you grow kelp faster than the rate at which nutrients can be provided, then effectively what you're doing is starving that region of the ocean. Um, and therefore other organisms that might want to use those nutrients are no longer able to do so. So we've got to think really carefully about this issue of nutrient provision. And that's the risk that we are acutely aware of and trying to devise schemes whereby that risk can either be removed or it's certainly minimised. So how do you monitor it? And also, who are you working with? I believe this is a collaborative effort. Yes, yeah, so there's a group uh, for the first project, which is in the upwelling zone with Kelp Forest Foundation and Kelp Blue. And the idea is to A, clearly uh, measure the amount of kelp that's being grown, but then also to take samples uh, within the water uh, before and after uh, the deployment of um, a raft, trying to get the kelp to grow and looking at the, the chemical balances. But where we're really interested in uh, is looking at other places where that aren't in upwelling zones. And the concerns about nutrient provision, ultimately, what we're looking at is how might you get more nutrients to be provided to the surface waters of the deep ocean? There are two, there are two big ideas that have come about. And the first is sort of a more of an engineering approach where you use a solar powered or wind powered pump to go and bring some of the deeper water uh, which is more nutrient rich, so richer in nutrients, to bring that up to the surface waters. That gosh, when you look at the numbers that are going to be involved, that's quite a lot of water to move. Because effectively what we're asking is to increase the degree of mixing between the deep waters and the surface waters. And uh, a more, I guess, revolutionary kind of idea is where the kelp platform itself might actually sink and go take the kelp to the nutrient rich waters. So the idea being that if you can get the kelp platform to traverse through the several hundred metres of the uh, surface waters of the, of the ocean at night when the kelp isn't growing as such because it's, it photosynthesises and therefore at, at night it's not photosynthesising, if you can get it into the deep waters for long enough, then the question is, can the kelp act like a sponge, take in the nutrients and then the following day, bring it back up and therefore into the photic zone and allow it to grow. So that's one, the second big idea. And the real benefit of that scheme is that one of the other risks that you have with growing a kelp platform is that if you have a hurricane or a typhoon coming through, it can actually destroy these surface platforms. Whereas if, it, if you take it tens of meters down, it's then back in the safety of the water you know, away from the hurricane. And so this might be the way to provide resilience to these uh, to these platforms. So against these you know, terrible weather conditions, but also provide the way of getting the kelp to have enough nutrients and therefore not risking a depletion of nutrients in the surface waters and minimizing the risks. Okay, well, that sounds quite ingenious. You've mentioned that it's ideas at this stage. So status-wise, where are you? Well, the work in Cambridge is at the moment focused on modelling. So there's a, a team in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics uh, led by Professor John Taylor. Um, so he's building a team there on the modelling of actually not just kelp, but modelling of the of the oceans and nutrients. So it's got um, Implications also for other schemes such as marine biomass regeneration, although we've started off thinking about the challenges and opportunities, therefore, uh, to do with kelp. But we're working very closely with the folks at Kelp Forest Foundation and Kelp Blue because modelling in and of itself teaches you so much, but you've got to ground the models in reality and give them enough data so that actually you've got a model 
that is filling in the gaps. A model is not there just to tell you everything. The idea is that you want to use experimental data. This is field scale experimental data. There will be some lab experiments as well that will be done as well, but to, gr to ground the model in data and then use the model to certainly fill in the gaps and maybe extrapolate a bit further. But that's the joy of modeling working with experimentalists. Okay, and have you got an estimated time when you might be deploying one of these field studies? Well, the field studies are started already. Oh, so they are. Kelp Blue okay. and Kelp Forest Foundation, they've started uh, getting the raft built just off the coast of Namibia, and they've started growing the kelp. It's really exciting. Uh, but he, these are baby steps. We've got a long way to go, but it is really, really exciting. Okay, and what about these ideas of moving up and down through the water column? So that one is at the more idea stage rather than the experimental stage. But it is something I'm really keen to develop further because you know, adjusting the buoyancy of the kelp platform, the big question is by how much would you, for example, need to expand a chamber for the same mass in order to change the overall density of the platform sufficiently that it would then sink or rise. So we've got these big questions first to figure out, well, what are the changes that you need and how are you going to power that? Because you won't need, for example, as much power as bringing water um, from the deep up to the surface waters day in, day out with a solar powered, wind powered turbine with batteries on board. But you are it's still going to need some energy in order to change the buoyancy. We think it's going to involve rather less energy and as I mentioned before, it's got this lovely other co-benefit of making it more resilient against uh, severe weather events. OK, and if you get positive results and you, things are going you know, pretty good, what sort of scalability do you see on this? I mean, what what's the end game impact that you're really excited about? There well, must be one. <laughs> I mean, there is. And from a from a climate point of view, the Centre for Climate Repair, we're not really that interested in tinkering at the edges. We we're interested in greenhouse gas removal approaches that when scaled up and deployed on a global scale, get you to something like a gigaton or more than a gigaton of carbon dioxide per year being sequestered. Because at the moment, just big numbers, you know, we are emitting something like 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. And... You know, at the moment, it's not going down. I mean, it's, OK, the rate of growth appears to have slowed down, but it's still going in the wrong direction. So, you know, it's 40 gigatons, given approaches. There isn't one silver bullet that's going to take the whole 40 that we're aware of. And therefore, we need to sort of choose choose the approaches. But, you know, lots of little things will still add up to a little thing, or rather lots of very little things will add up to a little thing. We're interested in the gigaton scale. And initial estimates are that if you did this um, and covered a reasonable, you know, a few percent of the ocean, you start to get some pretty interesting numbers. Okay. Um, so you are, you reckon that ultimately there's a there's a billion tons plus of sequestration in this. There is, a, there is the potential, Nick. And as I said, it's still at the research stage, and therefore, you know, we need to be careful on the risk side. We need to be careful about overstating as well. But we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't think it had um, significant potential. Okay. And you mentioned global emissions just now. As we move towards COP27, and on the back of what many regard as a pretty failed and flawed process, what do you think the successes are that we can really look for in this approaching COP? And given that it's, you know, it's based in Africa, it's, it's being seen as a vulnerable nations COP, do you think there are successes we can we can look for? So certainly in the Northern Hemisphere over the last two years, the increased severity of these severe weather events has just brought it more closer to home. People's rea realising that we're just not equipped to cope with um, the impacts of very hot summers. And similarly, when it comes to the winter, we're not going to be able to cope with you know, lots of flooding and things like this. So we've got to, to, to get a lot more serious about doing the fundamental thing of grappling with the root cause and it is about emissions reduction there so what i would really really hope for out of cop 27 is an increased desire and commitment for people nations to just stop building out coal fire power stations for example and let's not muck around by thinking we're solving it by just moving to gas we've got to go much harder than that and the dash for gas look at what that's done in terms of the 
uh, the challenge regarding lack of resilience, security of supply, that language, you know, in terms of just, it's all not, it's all too centralized, not distributed enough. Whereas things like solar power, wind power, uh, yes, they're more volatile in some ways, but politically they're far less volatile. And therefore, when you go and look at what you really mean by security of supply, then in fact, some of these alternative uh, schemes, wind and solar being the two that, that are first in my mind, that are carbon free, they have got, we've got to do so much more with these and increase our investment in this significantly. That's what I would really like to see. And supporting developing nations so that they don't make the same mistakes that frankly we have. It's, we are not covered in glory. Those are the more uh, developed nations. We've got to help other countries not tread in our footsteps, but do things differently because they could do far better than we have. And just to end on, really, I mean, we're talking, we're always talking about this space that we're operating in. And this will be very much the case with you at the Centre for Climate Repair. You always have to assume that you have the space to operate in. But we, things are getting the things are accelerating and they you know it's getting scarier out there do you think um with the sort of concurrent and continual sort of impacts around the world that that we are starting to lose that front foot response and we're starting to be pushed onto the back foot in responding to these challenges so i don't think it is a back foot um i do think that um the approach to the center for climate repair we have three uh, the three-pronged attack, the first R is to reduce emissions. The second R is to then remove greenhouse gases, hence the kelp. And the third R is to, to actually worry a lot about the timescales that are involved in sorting out the first two R's. So our third R is to, we call it refreeze the Arctic. But it does mean doing things that we can actually reduce the amount of the sun's energy coming into the earth. So reflect. Um some of the sun's uh, rays. Now, this term that some people have used in the past, geoengineering, is not welcomed by many people. And it certainly hasn't been welcomed by the, the national funding agencies. I think things are changing now, that there is something that we need as an absolute minimum and, a, and an absolute priority is to develop our understanding of those sorts of approaches very quickly, because this could be what we have to resort to in order to buy us time to get our house in order, the planet in order on reducing emissions, removing greenhouse gases. So this area, if anything, as a result of the lack of progress on the first two hours, has raised the the importance of getting on with research at the moment for this third hour of refreezing the Arctic or, or reflecting some of the sun's radiation. I see that as absolutely critical because the research might teach us why that's such a terrible idea. It could do. Or it could say, well, this is how you should do it if you're going to do it at all. But it's not for the scientists to decide whether it should be used. That is a decision for wider society at large. Well, I think with the level of anxiety rising, I may be speaking to you again about that at some point. Great. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sean. It's been great to speak to you. Thanks, Nick. Thanks again for listening. If you are interested to help support this series and help expand the discussion around climate topics, then please do consider backing my channel via Patreon. It will help me produce more content and you will also gain access to more expert interviews. It would be great to engage more with audiences too and understand your views on these topics.